Welcome to Elevate Louisiana's Engage Videocast. Elevate Louisiana was founded in 2020 to empower women leaders throughout Louisiana by connecting and educating them on the challenges impacting our state with data-driven nonpartisan solutions to make a better future for Louisiana. Hi there, I'm Julie Stokes with Elevate Louisiana. In today's Engage Videocast, we're discussing Louisiana's budget with Commissioner Jay Darden. Jay is the Commissioner of Administration for the state of Louisiana, and in that capacity, he serves as the state's Chief Operating Officer. He was elected twice as Louisiana's Lieutenant Governor and previously served four years as Louisiana Secretary of State, also 15 years as State Senator, and also three years as a Baton Rouge Metro Councilman. He chaired the Senate Finance Committee and in 2003 was named National Republican Legislator of the Year. Commissioner Darden, thank you so much for being with us today on Louisiana's uh, Elevate Louisiana's videocast. Well, you're welcome. It's always good to be with you, Julie. Thanks for what you're doing with this program. Thank you so much. And thank you for all that you do. And um, you've devoted really your entire life to serving the state of Louisiana and we really appreciate it. Uh, you're always great to talk to from your talks on Louisiana and the many facets of all that makes us culturally Louisiana, all the way down to all the accounting that's wrapped up in our state budget. And uh, it's always entertaining and you're very appreciated. Today, we're gonna focus on the state budget, which is not as entertaining as the Louisiana stories, but the good news is that this year, it is more entertaining than it has in a lot of the other years <laughs> in the You're, right about that. You're exactly <laughs> right, Julie. I mean, we've got, we've got money this year and it comes from a, a variety of different sources. And obviously it'll be the legislature's job and prerogative to decide how those dollars are spent. But it's quite a turnaround from where we were six or seven years ago when we were facing deficits. We now have a huge amount of federal money as well as uh, more money from state general fund that had been expected. So. I'm happy to kind of give you an idea of what the executive budget looks like, what the governor's proposed to the legislature. And we're certainly hopeful that most of what we suggest will, will stay in it throughout the process. That would be great. That's exactly what we're looking for today is to try to understand as we, as we just begin this legislative session, what we can expect to see um, in terms of the money, which um, if you, as a CPA, I can tell you everything everything is really about the money in this world <laughs> when it comes down to what programs you can offer and what your problems and successes are going to be as a state. So let's hear it. Let's rip the band-aid off and let us know what's going on. It's, uh, it's all about opportunity this year and that's why this first slide shows you what an opportunity we have. These are one-time sources of money that are available to the legislature in the session that began this week. Uh, the American Rescue Plan, which is the congressional appropriation that came last year, gave Louisiana over $3 billion. The legislature allocated $1.6 million of that last year, and so there's $1.4 I said million, billion last year, so there's $1.4 billion left to be spent this year. We've made a series of recommendations that I'll get into momentarily about how to spend that money. We also have a surplus from last year's budget, which ended on June 30th of last year, of $700 million. The Constitution tells us how that money has to be spent, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And then finally, we have a projected excess in the current budget year, which will end June 30th of this year. Uh, that means we have more money coming in that had been, that had been recommended by the Revenue Estimating Conference, which is the body that's charged with determining how much money we think we'll have during a, a budget year. Right now, that excess is over $800 million. So you can see we have $2.8 billion in one-time money to spend. And we will recommend spending that one-time money, obviously, on one-time needs. Uh, we're not gonna propose, and never have proposed in this administration, that we use one-time money for recurring expenses. That was the trap that was created in the previous administration that we had to dig out from under when Governor Edwards took office uh, in, in 2016. So $2.8 billion in one-time money. Uh, what are we gonna do with that money? Um, well, let me see, I'll get to my next slide. Well, it, it's right. really exciting that y'all are thinking about the importance of not spending 
one-time money on recurring expenditures. Um, you know, I don't know how much people in Louisiana think about that, but when you do that, then you set yourself up for eventual failure when that one-time money is gone. Well, that's right. And you, and you remember all too well during your days in the House when we were facing those challenges. And and this legislature, I don't believe, is going to repeat, repeat those problems. We certainly are not advocating doing that. So um, I'm, I'm optimistic that this one-time money is going to get invested in one-time needs. Um, so talking about the American Rescue Plan, I mentioned that, that $3 billion and the money that's been spent. We're recommending that that $1.3 billion be spent primarily in three areas. The Unemployment Insurance Fund, $550 million. This is the money that is paid out to folks who are unemployed when they've lost their job. And obviously during the pandemic, we drained this account to nothing, as did most states. Uh, we need about $750 million for that fund to be stable and to be able to, to make certain it can make the necessary payments that may arise. Based upon people going back to work, the fund has been replenished to the tune of about $200 million. So we think $550 million is the right number to put in this fund to make sure that we will not have to increase the amount paid by state employers into the fund because there's an automatic uh, increase on employers if the fund does not have an appropriate balance. The legislature suspended that during the pandemic, but we think it's time to use this one-time money to shore up that fund. We'll also recommend $275 million in transportation projects, obviously roads and bridges and uh, those one-time expenditures that are a huge infrastructure need across the state. And then the third recommended pot is for the water and sewer projects that are so necessary across the state. The legislature put $300 million into this pot last year. We have well over a billion dollars in need and we had applications that obviously clearly exceeded the $300 million that, that has already now been allocated by the Water Sector Commission and approved by the Legislative Committee. We wanna put another $559 million in there so we can provide even more assistance to failing water systems across the state. This is a huge problem uh, and the legislature has developed a, a very sensible plan that awards points on which projects should get the awards based upon their ability to sustain the programs, their willingness to combine programs to consolidate so that smaller programs that are simply not financially viable can latch on to existing programs that are. Um, so this has proven to be very, very popular among local governments and we think a big chunk of money ought to go in there to continue this. Is, um, is this like, you know, I, 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 I live in the New Orleans area, so I'm familiar with some of the needs of New Orleans. And I, I, I also, you know, sat on legislative audit. And when you sit on legislative audit, you have a, a long line of small parishes and small municipalities that are having issues with this too. Is this primarily aimed at those rural areas or can big areas like the New Orleans look to see some of this? Big areas can apply as well, and some of the big municipalities have received awards. The maximum that you can get is $5 million. So it doesn't make a dent in a big program like the water and sewer challenges that New Orleans faces, but it is primarily going to assist those rural, those smaller parishes, those rural programs, uh, those rural water systems that just are not financially viable. Yeah. People don't realize just how bad some of the water in some parts of the state are. And this is our opportunity to change that. Yeah. Um, transportation projects, the $275 million that I mentioned, our recommendation is $100 million for the bridge in Lake Charles, which is the amount of money that they need to keep that project on track. It is, it is already moving. Um, another $100 million for the I-49 project in South Louisiana to connect uh, from Lafayette to New Orleans. Um, we have a, an opportunity fund we've, we're calling it for DOTD to be able to use $50 million to match federal projects that may become available to them. And we just received recently a ruling from uh, Treasury that these ARP dollars can be used to match those federal funds if there is adequate lost revenue from the pandemic. And that certainly qualifies here. So that's really good news because you normally can't use federal money to match federal money. And then finally, a $25 million allocation to the Baton Rouge-New Orleans rail project that has been under discussion for quite some time. And 
Um, there, that is, we're having some discussions about that project and you may see recommendations that we try and sweeten that pot a little bit as we go forward. How does, um, how do these funds, I mean, how, how close do these funds that you were just talking about get us to being able to complete any of those projects? They're, they're going to be a further step in each of those projects. They won't bring any of them to conclusion, but there'll be a significant contribution toward each one that'll move the projects along. So they're part of an overall funding mechanism that, that is not going to be satisfied fully by those dollars that we're recommending. Uh, the water sector fund I mentioned earlier, 65% of that money went to 81 water projects, 35% went to 35 sewer projects. And as I mentioned, we're recommending another $559 million in, in this available money. Um, now, that's the ARC dollars, the federal money that, that came down. Let's talk about the 21 surplus, that is the fiscal year 21 surplus of $700 million. Um, the Constitution requires that 25% of that go to the rainy day fund, that's $175 million, and that 10% go to the unfunded accrued liability in our retirement systems, that's another $70 million. The remainder we're recommending go to the DOTD highway program, again, to match some funds that would be available to Louisiana from projects that other states did not use and $171 million to match infrastructure projects that are going to be available on a competitive basis uh, or on an allocation to Louisiana from the uh, IIJA, the infrastructure bill that passed Congress right before the end of the year. We've also recommended $150 million for CPRA and $109 million for capital outlay deferred maintenance. These are required allocations constitutionally of a surplus. So highway program, CPRA master plan projects and capital outlay are the three available uh, recipients of surplus dollars in addition to those rainy day fund and UAL allocations. This is just gonna be a tremendous boon to uh, the state. I mean, honestly, the, um, just so that if anybody that's listening doesn't know that the state has a, a, a June 30th year end. So fiscal year 21 has been over for, you know, sometimes six, eight months, I guess. Um, one of the things that I was curious about when I see this money going into the rainy day fund, where will that put us on the rainy day fund roughly? The rainy day fund with this allocation is gonna be larger than it was when Governor Edwards took office. So despite the fact that we've had to tap into the rainy day fund during our fiscal challenges a few years ago, we've been able to shore that fund back up to the extent that it's now bigger than it was when we got here. It's in the $700 million range now. Um, so that's, that's very good. I mean, we're that's a lot bigger. in really good shape. Uh, and we'll continue to provide additional funding to that fund when this current year ends, because I believe we will indeed have a surplus at the end of this fiscal year, which ends on June 30th. Yeah, and another thing that a lot of people don't realize is um, that this unfunded accrued liability, so there's all of this old pension debt that the state is, is constitutionally bound to have paid off by 2029. And that, you know, we're well on our way to 2029 and we're, we're in some times right now where we have lots of this, um, what's called the UAL pay down that we're doing right now. And things ought to get a lot easier in our state when that's um, finished in 2029, huh? Right, and if you look at those payments, it's, it's really a, a kind of a bell curve that started out relatively low and it peaked a few years ago, and now we're on the downward slide. So between now and in 29, we have a very manageable amount of money that is needed to pay down that UAL obligation, and, and you're right, once that's done, it's going to take care of the, the uh, debt we had previously that could not be satisfied. We'll continue to have accruals in those retirement areas, but we'll start anew, and we will have taken care of the, uh, the problem that was addressed constitutionally a number of years ago. Perfect. All right, so now moving, well, this just shows you the budget stabilization fund that I was talking about, that we're back up over $700 million. 721 is that projected balance now that we just talked about. So now the FY22 excess, we call money that is available when a fiscal year ends surplus. We refer to it as it's accruing during the fiscal year as excess. 
So right now we have an anticipated excess in FY22 of 800 and some odd million dollars. Um, and this is based upon the revision to the forecast that took place in May of 2021 that was only recently updated on January 11th of 2022. And that general fund went up by $847 million, meaning that we anticipate that much more in revenue in the current year. So the legislature is free to expend that money during the current year for needs that have arisen during this year, the money that is not expended will become surplus at the end of the of the fiscal year. That's amazing. And what do you think, what, what causes that much of, you know, for taxes and um, all of that to have gone up that much this year? I mean, I kind of thought it was probably some rebuilding from Ida and... Well, it, it's really the, the biggest part of it, Julie, is the fact that a year ago, we lowered the forecast dramatically because we were in the throes of the pandemic. So we, we were very conservative in what we thought our estimate would be so that we wouldn't be faced with mid-year budget cuts, but the economy performed a lot better than I think was anticipated. And so we've had more economic activity. Unfortunately, the storms do generate additional spending and additional um, re to tax revenue. That's not the kind of things we want to generate that revenue, but I'm sure that had a bit of a factor. But the main thing was we had a low forecast to begin with. So what are we going to do with this recommended uh, funding from the current year? Um, the money will be spent in two different legislative instruments. The supplemental bill is a bill that allocates money to be spent in the current fiscal year before it ends. The funds bill is a bill that requires money to be deposited into particular funds that have been created by the legislature and the particular expenditure within those funds has been dictated by law. So some money will go into the supplemental bill, some money will go into the funds bill. Um, and, and here's what the recommendation is. $400 million to make the second payment back to the Corps of Engineers for the state's obligation as its share of the hurricane storm damage and risk um, reduction program that, that built the, the levees and the, the storm damage protection for New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, that bill has come due for the state, and thanks to the help of our delegation in Congress, we were able to negotiate payments on this debt and a waiver of a huge amount of interest that otherwise would be owed. We've made $400 million payment. We'll make the second with the money that's available this year. We'll still potentially owe another $300 million next year, but our plan is to get a credit for projects that we have paid for on our own nickel that have enhanced that storm damage protection system so that we won't have to make a third and final $300 million payment back to the Corps of Engineers. That's great. That's a big deal. A very big deal. And we're also planning on repaying $450 million to FEMA for the cost share obligations that the state has for the 16 to 20 some odd storms we've had dating all the way back to Katrina all the damage that was incurred, the FEMA was responsible for a significant percentage of it, but the state had a share as well. And uh, these obligations have been accruing and we're now gonna use one-time money to pay those debts. Uh, we're depositing $50 million into an early childhood fund that is enabling us to, to provide matching money to local districts that create programs to provide educational opportunities for birth to three-year-olds. That's a very significant $50 million pot of money, again, one time. $42.5 million to DOTD, once again, to draw down federal dollars that will have become available that we have a, a local match requirement on. And $500 million deposit for a, a newly created fund for the new Mississippi River Bridge. Legislators have already expressed some concern about this. Nevertheless, we think this is a, an extremely wise and important investment of $500 million to tell the federal government and to tell potential private investors that we're committed to building a new bridge in Baton Rouge. It's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna be several years, perhaps even a decade in the making, but you have to start somewhere. And we think the best time to start is when we have this kind of one-time money and say we're committing this money for that particular project. Legislators have indicated they're not gonna provide as much as the 500 million we've recommended, 
Uh, we think 500 million is a good and appropriate number, but whatever we can do, we think is important to signal a significant down payment on the bridge. So that, how much do, are they saying that the, the bridge will cost and what other funding sources does it have? It is, it is gonna be probably a billion dollars or more. Um, it's gonna have to have some federal dollars supporting it. It's also gonna need tolls. And there are probably gonna be tolls associated with the bridge. Um, and that's why you want private investors to be incentivized to, to invest in building the bridge, knowing that the bonded indebtedness can get paid back with, um, with tolls. Um, so now's the time to make a commitment to the bridge that we all know is, is desperately needed. Yeah, that's um, really. There are a number, other, a number of other sources of, of money that the supplemental and, and funds bill will go to. I won't go through all those, but again, they're gonna be one-time payments in order to, uh, to make certain we're only using one-time money on one-time needs. So overall, if our recommendations were to be fully accepted by the legislature, and I recognize that that's probably not gonna happen, but if it were to happen, we would be committing over a billion dollars in one-time money through various sources for roads and bridges in Louisiana. And, and I think most people would recognize that is as desperate a need as we have in the state. And now is the time with this glut of one-time money to take advantage of addressing the infrastructure needs and making that investment. So that takes care of the one-time money that we have from these three different sources. Now let's talk about the executive budget that begins on July 1. Uh, the revenue forecast tells us that we have over $10 million, billion dollars in our state general fund up by over $700 million from where we thought it would be. And this is a complicated slide, but Julie, you are asking about this on what the revenue projection looked like before the pandemic and now. And you can see, those who can see this, this graph, that back in 2019, we, uh, we were, were expecting uh, as much as over $12 billion in state general fund revenue. That, has not materialized and is not going to materialize. Um, and this is not just, I'm sorry, this is not just state general fund. This is all taxes, licenses, and fees. This would include um, money that's statutorily dedicated as well. But you can see that we have not, we're not reaching exactly where we thought we would be on that trajectory, but we're close based upon the recovery that we've experienced. So we went through these challenging times where the state general fund and the taxes, license, and fee numbers were down. They were supplanted by federal dollars that became available during that time period, but we are not relying on any federal money to balance this budget for 23. We've removed all of those, the vestiges of those dollars from the proposed budget. Is the budget um, that's in place right now is based on oil being at $65 a barrel or something, right? And yeah, I don't with, remember the number, but yes. Yeah, and with all that's going on right now and oil, I don't know, I think last time I heard it was $120 a barrel. Um, do we look to see, you know, there's a lot at play here with the Ukrainian situation and uh, do we look to see that increase in the price of oil be a boon to Louisiana's uh, state general fund? Not really. I wouldn't call it a boon. I think it's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to give us an improved outlook. I think when REC meets again, probably in May, my guess is the recommendation will be to increase the, the price of oil, but not dramatically. The hundred plus dollar a barrel has already dropped down. Um, and economists look for long-term trends. They're not going to base their recommendation on either a full collapse like we saw a few years ago or um, an incredibly unexpected rise up to the $100 plus per barrel at the outset of the Ukrainian crisis. So they'll be looking long-term at what they think it's going to do. I'm not the economist, but my guess is we may increase that number slightly from where it is now, but I don't think it'll be hugely dramatic. Yeah, and that, oil and gas is a, it, the, the revenue to the state is so dramatically less than what it used to be. Back in the 80s, it was 40% of the state's budget. Now it's under 10% of the state's budget. I remember when I was in the, in the house, there was a, they would always talk about that for every dollar 
that the price of a barrel of oil was greater that it would result in $12 million more to the state. But I think that that assumes a lot greater production of oil happening in Louisiana and right off of its shore. And we may not see that sort of increase because of the nature of the situation right now. Yeah, I, I think that that's a fair assessment. I mean, obviously it's in Louisiana's best interest that the president allow as much drilling as possible offshore. And, and we need to see that happen. My personal view now, we need to see that happen as a hedge against our reliance upon foreign oil. Uh, from a policy standpoint, that's not the policy that's normally um, advanced by a Democrat administration or by a Democratic Congress. But um, Louisiana obviously has a vested interest in more, patro more production uh, happening because it improves our budget, it improves jobs that are available and so on. But um, you're right, uh, the, the way in which the price of oil impacts Louisiana's budget is going to be dramatically impacted if there's more production, because that's going to mean more jobs and more revenues reduced. Um, budget comparisons, just to show you the 21, uh, I'm sorry, the 22 budget, the 23 budget, and where we look, where we look like in the 23 budget, overall you can see um, a, a reduction there, primarily because um, we're not going to see the enhanced federal Medicaid rate that we enjoyed during the pandemic. That's going to that's going to dramatically drop, and that's the main factor that's that's affecting this. Um, here's your general fund budget comparison. You can see where we are in proposed 23 budget to where we were in years gone by. You can see the dip when we had the the challenges of not having enough revenue beginning in the uh, 11 year, and certainly going through first term of the Edwards administration, that's coming back up where our, our situation has improved. Um, this just gives you a snapshot of what a pie chart of how we spend the money looks. 36% uh, of the money goes to K-12 education, 26% goes to uh, the Department of Health, of Hosp of Health um, and 11% for higher ed. So, you know, that eats up a significant portion of the budget, not a big surprise there. So the executive budget, we're recommending a number of investments that look to the future without relying on any uh, one-time money. Um, so I mentioned earlier, we, we replace the one-time federal dollars now with state general fund dollars. No one-time federal money in the budget. The governor has recommended a pay increase for teachers of $1,500 for support workers of $750. We've also said, if and when the REC meets in May and increases the forecast, we'll be recommending that the first $50 million of an increased forecast increase that teacher pay from 1,500 to 2,000 and from the support workers from 750 to 1,000. How do Likewise, I, well, can I interrupt for one second? Because, um, you know, people are definitely talking about this item and where do our teachers stack up, you know, uh, when you compare them to other teachers in other states in this southern it's region? A, it's a, always a moving target because every time we raise salaries, other states are looking to do the same thing. So you never can get a, a comfort level with where we are against the southern average because it's a moving target. And I honestly don't know specifically where this will take us relative to other states, but obviously it will be an improvement in our ranking with a, an increase of this magnitude. Higher education faculty members also will enjoy a, a pay increase um, and, and other allocations to higher ed. I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, other, other payments, um, a rate increase for personal care services in the area of the elderly and the developmentally disabled, a supplemental pay increase for uh, first responders of $100 a month, increased rates for early childhood that I mentioned earlier. And again, just continuing with, with these investments, um, I won't go into the details of, of, of all of this. The, the Department of Education, the MFP, of course, is always fully funded. It's constitutionally mandated. And the student count for next year is projected to have a small increase, under like this, unlike the student count in this year, which is down, enabling us to provide some money to, to fund the early childhood fund that we talked about earlier. Uh, teacher pay raise we mentioned, and there's that early childhood rate increase that's going to enable our child care facilities to pay more to attract individuals who can provide the education.
educational component to K to, I'm sorry, to birth to three years old, not just daycare, but educational opportunities. And here's that investment in early childhood that I mentioned um, in a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. So um, what, can you go over this slide in a little bit of detail? Because uh, one, one of our platforms at Elevate Louisiana is support for this particular spending and trying to get early childhood ed a lot more funding so we can correct our situation here. This is really great news for early childhood education. The advocates will tell you this is the the biggest and most generous involve, uh, investment that's ever been made in early childhood. Um, the idea here was to include, in, to maximize the productivity, as I said earlier, to make sure that the people working in these child care facilities have the educational acumen to provide educational opportunities for the birth to three-year-old infant. And so we're increasing the rates to pay, be paid to providers to hire those type of people. We're increasing the rate on a per pupil basis for the LA4 program, which is one of the more advanced programs in the nation. We're increasing the rate for those uh, infants who are in non-public school early childhood programs and funding an additional 256 students on the waiting list for the, well, this really isn't an early childhood investment. This is on the slide, but it's not an early childhood investment. It's funding for the uh, private school um, tuition program. Uh, but in addition, I mentioned that $25 million in one-time money from this year's MFP that's going to create a fund for matching dollars for local districts that are willing to put their own skin in the game for early childhood investment. So uh, all this together is, is a very dramatic increase in early childhood, one of your priorities and one of our priorities. Absolutely. Higher education, again, significant dollars in higher education more of an increase that we've seen in higher education in more than a decade with faculty pay increases, mandated cost payments, formula funding increases, go grant increases, uh, an investment for Title IX offices across the state, uh, an obesity pilot program at Pennington, and, and a special allocation to LSU and Southern Ag programs that don't have students that otherwise would draw down uh, per student uh, in, uh, amount from the state. Uh, a special allocation to those programs, which are doing great research. Uh, the Department of Health budgets increased by over a half a billion dollars because the, the MATA fund, the Medicaid Assistance Trust Fund, goes has gone down, and the federal funds that were available during the pandemic have disappeared. Uh, we have not built that public health emergency enhancement into the budget because we think sometime in the current budget year, the public health emergency will end at the federal level, just as the governor recently ended the public health emergency in Louisiana. Yeah, and that's that's a, a really big deal. Um, you know, what, what happens here is that the federal government matches every dollar that we spend on our Medicaid population. And it's a little bit different from the between the expansion population and the, the regular Medicaid population. But I know that at one time after Katrina, we were also under an emergency, we, I call it FMAP, uh, with federal matching. And we were maybe like three and a half dollars of federal money to every one dollar. And then, you know, in the last several years, it had dropped way down to, what was it, like maybe one and a half or two dollars? Yeah, it's always about kind of a 60, 60, right. 633 rate of the, what the feds yeah. pay to what the state pays, that FMAP, that it enhanced, EFMAP, enhanced FMAP is what we got during the pandemic. That's what's going away. We won't get that any longer. We'll revert more to that more traditional 60 some odd, 30 some odd match rate. And with the kind of spending that we have um, on our, the Medicaid spending, it, it's an enormous amount of money that, um, that frees up somewhat to spend in other places. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and we enjoyed that during the pandemic. We, we won't have it any longer, but we have a significant Medicaid population, obviously, in Louisiana. So we get a disproportionate amount of money from the feds to take care of the, those individuals. Uh, this, this is a, a busy chart that shows you the, the rate increase that has gone to um, those who care for the elderly and the development, developmentally disabled in the state. 
Um, the advocates had asked for significant amounts of money, and frankly, they got most everything of what they asked for. They didn't get 100% of what they wanted, but it's a very dramatic increase in those rates. Uh, same thing here on nursing home rates, as well as on rates paid to those homes that care for uh, those individuals who've been declared um, mentally incapable of providing for their defense and, and criminally have been found guilty by reason of insanity, we have to pay for them are not guilty, I'm sorry, by reasons of insanity. And so we have to pay pi private providers to care for those individuals that otherwise would be a huge burden on the state. Those rates are going up under our recommendation. Um, this is um, a lot of information. I'm gonna skip through these slides because it just represents the investment that the state has made on very necessary and important IT projects across the state that are uh, making our systems a lot more advanced. Um, and again, we're able to make investments through some one-time money to, to do this in, in our technology areas, modernizing, updating our LaGov system, which is the, the, way state organ, the way state financing is handled, basically, and on cyber because of the, the threat of cyber attacks that have been all too real in Louisiana. We've had a very aggressive emergency uh, fund to deal with cyber that has responded to a number of local government challenges, as well as some at the state level. And this is a strategic partnership with the National Guard, state police, as well as our, our federal partners. <clears throat> and finally, um, a dramatic increase in funding for broadband to bring broadband to rural areas of the state through a grant that was established last year. Uh, even more money coming from the federal government in Louisiana has been at the vanguard of this rural broadband investment. Um, our, the head of our broadband program has been called upon to speak at a number of national programs based upon the rate at which we have taken advantage of this program. So it's a real success story for Louisiana. So Julie, finally the message summing it all up in my message to the legislature, we've got to seize the moment and don't blow it. This is $2.8 billion in one-time money that we have to invest. Let's use it for one-time need. Let's pay down debt. Let's seed the early childhood program. Let's invest the billion dollars on roads and highways and bridges. Um, let's increase teacher pay and faculty pay, uh, new dollars for higher ed. And, and on this slide, this is, this is recurring dollars. This is not one-time money. This is money that we're gonna increase what we pay on an ongoing basis with the improvements we've seen in our state budget. Um, so that's pretty much it for the for the uh, what it looks like for the budget. Um, obviously, we're at the beginning of a long process with the legislature. We think we have some very sound, fiscally responsible recommendations on how to invest in our future. We know that the legislature will have its own ideas and will make some appropriate changes. We hope they won't deviate too dramatically from what we've recommended with this one-time money. Program. Yeah, well, uh, it sounds like it sounds like a good plan, and I'll be excited um, to see what the legislature does. It certainly is a, a, a tremendous opportunity um, that Louisiana has before itself, and uh, you know, never waste a good crisis, right? Well, it, the the opportune word is opportunity, and that's what we have before us right now. And let's make certain we take advantage of the dollars that are available to us and do smart things with them. Uh, and I wanted to say, if you're listening to this and you're wanting to grab a copy of those slides somewhere, that I know that you can reach them if you Google it um, as Commissioner Darden's presentation to the Joint Legislative Committee on the Budget. And we will also put it on our website, a link to it um, in the information on this video cast so that you can um, take a look at that. Uh, Commissioner Darden, I just want to thank you for being here with us today and for all the hard work um, that I know that this has taken because it's not just as simple as putting your wish list down on paper. There's a whole lot of stakeholders and meetings and internal politics and external politics. Um, we really do appreciate it. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm blessed with a great staff to do a great job, and, and um, I'm really grateful to them for the, for the hard work they put in to, make, to put this budget together. But thanks for giving me the opportunity to share this information. Please call me again if, you, if you'd like to do so. I appreciate it. And I can't say enough about what you're saying about the people of this state that work in our state government. Um, I know when I was in the legislature, and, and I dealt with the administration, but I also dealt with legislative financial services, just great people, and they deserve our thanks too. So 
Thank you again. And um, for those of you listening, please save the date for legislative for our legislative day at the Capitol for Elevate Louisiana. That's going to be on April 27th. And for those of you listening, uh, if you're interested in joining Elevate and seeing more of our video guests or podcasts, visit our website at elevatela.org. That's elevate with two L's, la.org. I'm your host, Julie Stokes, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.